it's Lisa from Been There Got Out. And hopefully Instagram will let me see my guest. Her name is Chenille and she's a social worker and she has founded the Healing Springs Wellness Center. There she is. Okay, good. Let's see if this works. Chenille, wait for me to, oh, let me, it's a really weird thing lately where I can't see the person that I am talking to. So Chenille, I just invited you. Oh, no. Okay, good. It's working. It's working. I don't know what the place was. It's working. So, um, Shanil, why don't you introduce yourself and um, tell me what you do and then why you're so good at what you do. <laughs> well, thank you, Lisa, for having me on today. I'm honored to be in your community um, speaking. So I am a licensed clinical social worker, empowerment speaker, and I am the founder founder of Healing Springs Wellness Center, which is a counseling and holistic wellness center located, located in Plantsville, Connecticut. So we specialize in mental health, nutrition, and um, well, like holistic wellness, such as sound healing and Reiki. So we really focus on your mind, body, and spirit. Um, one of the things I would say is what led me into the field of social work is my own healing journey when healing my own relationship wounds and realizing how those patterns um, and wounds really show up in your present day life. So, you know, we're really trauma focused at the center and we really want to help people heal and transform so that they can live their fullest, most meaningful lives. Great. I, I see there's a comment that you, there's a sound healer from England watching right now. So cool. This is like the beauty of social media. Yes. All right. So um, I know that when Chris and I first started Been There Got Out, we were really broad and we're like, we're going to start from beginning to end with helping people deal with toxic relationships before we really niche down onto the family court stuff. Mm -hmm. But when we were doing that, we asked people what their most common concern was, and it was how to heal from toxic relationships and especially how to break the cycle. So what can people do? Like, first of all, when does this even begin? Well, I have to tell you that depending on, you know, your background, um, your experiences, this could start from being a child, right? Um, being in your family of origin and how your parents or caregivers really um, treated you, whether there was, um, you know, that security in the relationships and all your needs were met, or if you felt like there was some neglect, whether it was um, emotionally met, whether your physical needs, food, anything that might have um, created some injury um, in your upbringing, right? So it could start from childhood. Um, our parents, our caregivers are usually the frame of reference of how we um, should be treated in relationships, right? Um, I can also say that sometimes you've, you've had the best upbringing and it takes just one relationship, one experience that has happened in your life that might disrupt your confidence, that might disrupt um, your view on yourself, um, and it can really change the, the trajectory of your relationships. So for me, just to give you like a personal example, because I like to do that is, um, you know, I grew up without a father and uh, my mom was a single parent. So I had a lot of abandonment issues mm -hmm. and feeling like uh, I didn't have that father figure. And how that showed up in my life was I tend to date, I dated at the time, emotionally unavailable men. And I just had a pattern of that, of like, why, you know, why am I not prioritized? You know, just the same feelings of a lack of trust. And a pivotal moment was when I was in a seven year relationship and that engagement ended. And I had to do a lot of self reflection of why do I keep on having these same patterns of feelings and, you know, so forth. So it started with me for, from childhood and it kept on showing up in my present day by the type of people I would. I was dating, even friendships, right? Um, being left dissatisfied. So 
it can start as early as childhood and it could start as late as in your adult life and just having the wrong relationship, whether family, work, intimate partner. So it, you know, that's really where I would say it varies for each person. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, I have to say it's comforting to hear you give your personal experience and growing up without a father because, um, there's people here, including me, whose children are also growing up without another parent. Mm -hmm. And as parents, we fear that their lives are forever ruined because of us. And, and I'm, I'm glad to hear like you not only have worked on yourself and healed, but that you, you've taken it to a whole new level. Yeah. So, but, but I want to know too, so obviously in your adult life is when you realized it, how does somebody realize or how does somebody recognize that they have unhealed emotional issues because usually it takes like some i would imagine some major incident it's not like we were sitting around one day like you know what <laughs> how does it happen yeah i love i love that question i would say that it, there's a lot of self-reflection right so if you are encountering like a similar feeling like i would start with the emotions right um, in your relationships, again, it doesn't have to be intimate, uh, but mainly that's where we, we tend to find that it happens. If you're experiencing the same feeling, like the lack of trust, dissatisfaction, not feeling prioritized, right? Um, feeling triggered, you know, for some people, especially therapy clients, they might, you know, have a um, intimate encounter, like even sexually, where their body is just like, this doesn't feel good based on what I probably have experienced in my past, but like emotions are coming up. We tend to dismiss those things, but those are sure tell signs that something might be coming up, especially if it's a reoccurring feeling. And what I would say is like, if you've journaled before, like put that on paper, right? Like that was like transformational for me to like, just notice like what, what, how am I presenting in relationships who are coming to me, who am I attracting? And what are those feelings, bodily sensations, emotions that are just reoccurring? Let me look at them closer. And sometimes that takes a professional, right? To really be able to kind of get to the root cause of it, but know your body and like slow down enough to be like, okay, something's up here, right? You know, what do I need to do about this? Or what can I learn from this? Oh, Does that make sense? Her, yeah, so I'm a person like as I'm ta ta listening to you and talking, I'm taking all kinds of notes because I want to make sure to comment on some of the things you said. So what you just said about, pa I kept thinking about pausing and how it is so important to pause and how in my own personal life, I didn't pause, especially in the relationships that I would get involved with. And it sounds so stupid, but it's almost like if somebody wanted to be with me, I put what they desired more than how I actually felt. I never paused and thought, do I feel right getting involved with this person? It was more like all focused on what they wanted and not ever thinking about how my body felt. And I often think about how when I first was getting involved with my ex-husband, my body was resisting on, in many ways. It was almost like internally cringing. And somehow I didn't pay attention. I dismissed it and I kept saying, but on paper, but there's all these other things. And you have to understand that relationships are hard and marriage is a sacrifice. And so I really just, again, dismissed, dismissed my own feelings, which I think is really, really common in this community. The other thing that you said that I love is about journaling. I've personally kept journals for about 40 years, like since nice. I was a kid. And I have stacks and stacks of them and sometimes I've looked sometimes I'm afraid to look back on them but I had to spend a lot of time looking back on them during and after the divorce process at, in terms of documenting for my attorney things and it's amazing the stuff we write down that we don't remember that we said and to look back on what we write and how like the real stuff comes out like we're honest with ourselves when we write mm -hmm. we can't help it Often it's our subconscious that just takes over. And it's fascinating when you write things down to look at it and say, wow, that's how I really felt. Like, I wish I had paid attention to that. Did you find that too when you, you look back at some of your patterns? Absolutely. I felt like the journal was that mirror into myself and yeah. being able to track that 
Um, and, you know, some things we got to take responsibility for, right? Like some things like how are we showing up um, in these relationships? But it really kind of was that mirror. Um, so journals are powerful and just reflecting back because you can reflect, uh, you know, hindsight, hindsight is twenty twenty. So it's like, you know, you should have could have done that. But it really kind of just gives you more of that place of non-judgmental, but like, okay, what can I change for the future? Or let me look at my growth, like where I was 40 years ago to where I'm now, you know, is huge, right? So it just helps you to kind of, you know, put those things on paper and, you know, keep that. Yeah. Mark. Well, unfortunately, I think people in our community often beat themselves up because mm -hmm. they say, how could I have done this again and again and again? And often our people, when they come out of like a really bad relationship or, or the last really bad relationship, <laughs> they'll say, I am so tired of this. I cannot get involved with anyone again romantically. And we're forgetting that like friendships can also be intimate okay. too and family and work and all that. But they'll just be like, I'm never going to date again. Um, I'm done. Like I'm good. And I often think, well, that person stole how much of your past they ruined this much of your past and i know it can be really hard but if you don't allow or figure out a way to open yourself up again then you've allowed them to steal your future like you've allowed them to ruin your entire life so what can you do with people to help them overcome their fears of more betrayal trauma yeah uh, that's a great I love that you brought that up. And I think that at the end of the day, it's a form of self-protection, right? And sometimes uh, automatically our mind and our body is just gonna put us in shutdown mode. And there's like, oh no, we're not gonna experience that again. And it creates that generalization um, for future relationships, even healthy, right? So I think that acknowledgement of, okay, I went through something that was very traumatic and very hard and being able to be gentle with self and compassionate and saying, okay, I went through this. Um, and even though I can't change the past, I can learn from this and grow from this. And sometimes you do need, again, professional help because you got to help your body to feel safe, right? You got to help your mind to feel safe, to even be brave enough to have any other future experiences, right? Put yourself out there. And that might be the healing process of right, really kind of digging deep, getting to the root cause to break those patterns. So sometimes your your mind and body's like, okay, I don't believe you. <laughs> like, even though you're like, I don't believe that this is gonna work this time, but it's you reconditioning and reprogramming. And that might take additional support to get to that place. Yeah. yeah. And and I like how you mentioned too, it's it's your your body and your mind learning to feel safe. And I'm sure I'm, a lot of us have read it or at least heard of the book, The Body Keeps the Score, mm -hmm. and how trauma stored in our body. And I know even years after sometime I would be doing something and suddenly I would just cry or I just feel like really emotional. I'm like, where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. It was weird. Do you see that with your clients too? Or so because you are a holistic practice, do you notice where people are kind of astonished that their body is still holding on to something and it's coming out like when you're not even talking about it. Yeah, yes. I think that was, um, you know, I do EMDR, which is called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And what really EMDR looks at the, you know, the experiences that you had, mainly trauma and traumas get stored in different ways, right? Um, images, bodily sensations, emotions, right? Like it hits your body in different ways. And so when those triggers, it could be a sound, it could be a smell, it could be, mm -hmm. you know, someone said something or their tone is off, right? It really um, shows that there's still these unhealed parts. So if you're getting these triggers, it's really kind of saying, hmm, okay, what what is what's happening coming from a place of curiosity? Like, where is that coming from? Or what does that remind me of, right? And what what else do I need to do to kind of um, heal those parts, you know, heal those parts, but coming from a place of curiosity. Um, but it does happen. And I think even when you're, you've done the healing work, right, because it's a journey, um, you will notice that even when you've cleaned up these wounds, sometimes you'll still get triggered or, or a reminder, right? 
And it's just to kind of say, just that awareness and just giving yourself a moment, a pause to be like, oh, you know, what, what, what just happened here, right? Just acknowledgement because we tend to disregard the feedback that we're getting and just slowing down and acknowledging is like the most powerful step to then figuring out. What yeah, and I do. think we tend to do things like say to ourselves, I shouldn't be feeling this. Yeah. It's been this many years. Why am I still getting upset over something and minimize? And other people do the same thing. It's been 10 years. How come you're not all better? Why are you still thinking about it? Um, and the other thing that I really like, uh oh, Shanelle, you're frozen. Hopefully oh. you can still hear me. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. All right. Now you're not. Um, it, well, first of all, before I even get to this, I see my partner, Chris, said that EMDR was an amazing experience for him personally because he did it and it was powerful. I think in one or two sessions, incredible. But that's that's like a whole other topic, EMDR. But, yeah. but it really does does work. But I like how you talk about approaching what's going on, let's say a trigger, from a place of curiosity, because I think we often are afraid. Mm -hmm. And so what are some strategies that you can do, you, you, you know, as a clinician or things that, that people can learn to move from fear to curiosity? Like what are some ways that they can start changing these patterns? Yeah, definitely. So I would say, you know, mindfulness is a big thing, right? Like, so again, being able to track like, these feelings that are coming up um, and these bodily sensations. So just really pu pulling them out, either writing them down or talking to your therapist, that's awesome, you know, that's really good. Um, I would say that being able to, when we store it in, you know, like when we have like, we're, we're holding in all these emotions, it becomes stronger. Right. And it's going to come out in different ways. So I always say, like, if you could talk it out, write it out, it at least manifests in a different way outside of your body, outside of your mind. And then it's less scary and powerful. But when we are like uh, having that pressure cooker of all this stuff, you know, coming internally, it holds us down. It's like a weight. Right. So mm -hmm. really being able to start with that. Um, I think that inner child work, especially if you were someone who experienced trauma in childhood, I always say like tapping into that part of you that feels neglected or still feels tra traumatized. So for me, five-year-old self didn't have a father, you know, left my father in Jamaica. And it was like, I kept on telling that five-year-old, you'll be fine just neglecting that part instead of saying, Oh, you're feeling triggered. You know, what's going on? What do you need? Even if you don't have the work, like, what do you need right now? For some people, it's a hug. It could be like a, you're, you're hugging yourself. It could be like, I just need some play or joy. Um, but really just the acknowledgement is the powerful step. Um, I would say grounding. If you are feeling like this is overwhelming, I'm being overwhelmed with an emotion. Um, what can I do? Some deep breathing. Maybe I can, you know, connect with a friend, but instead of like, bog, you know, pushing it down, how do we acknowledge it? How do we ask ourselves what we need? How do we kind of manifest it in a different way, in a physical form, writing, talking, you know, whatever that looks like is important. Yeah. And um, what you said about getting it out, I think that's really important. I know. Um, <laughs> You, I've told you, Chanel, that our clients are dealing with high conflict legal issues, post-judgment, and it just goes on and on and on for years. And so one of the things they have to learn is how to communicate with someone that they despise mm -hmm. in a way that looks all right and peaceful because usually it's a co-parenting situation. And that's really hard. And so we put them on something we call the permission slip plan, where it's like you can send us you have to send us the draft. We have to make sure it's okay before you send it to your ex. But they'll sometimes, some of our clients would be like, this is what I want to say, <laughs> but I shouldn't. I'm like, no, get it out. Like it is so important. You need to get it out. You're not supposed to write this beautiful like email for your ex that a judge is going to look at. You have to still get it out to feel better. And 
that's what we're there for. Like, send us the stuff. We we I we came up with like a, a book idea of like the, what I really wanted to say to my ex. <laughs> so we're collecting those yeah. stories, yeah. <laughs> but over here, but that you know, but it it is so important not to have. I, I love your term of the pressure cooker and the weight of keeping it in or not having outlets of anybody to talk to or ways to get it out because it doesn't just go away. And the other thing is when you talked about your five-year-old self and the issue with your father, I think people try to also be like, it's going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. Instead of just pausing again and saying, you know what, this is really unfair. Like this is, it is like a terrible thing that you experience. And so how maybe sometimes you have to be able to say it to yourself, like, I have a right to feel this way mm -hmm. and it is really bad and other people don't have this. And it's not that you're feeling sorry for yourself, but you're just acknowledging that you're having this emotion, right? Instead of just saying, I shouldn't, I should be healed. It should be better. I should be doing everything right. Like it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. And do you find also that healing, we see it with our clients. It's not, it's not a progression forward. No. <laughs> you know it is like a squiggly line that you're just like, oh my goodness, right? And one minute you're feeling good and something happens, but just having that person to bounce off of, like, I'm really feeling good today, but I'm really feeling shitty today. Mm -hmm. And I always also say there's duality, like one minute you could be crying and the next minute you're laughing in the same moment. And and that's okay, right? I think there's power in feeling, right? right? And a lot of us have been taught not to feel or it's not safe to feel, but when you're in an environment or you're with, um, you know, like a professional or a supportive community that you can pull out those raw feelings, it's so important, but it, healing is not linear. Um, and even if you've done some healing work, some things are gonna come up, it's a journey, right? And embracing, that journey. I mean, I still get triggered from my seven year relationship and I've been with someone for 11 years, healthy, secure. And sometimes I'll react in a way and I'm like, is that really relevant to this situation? Or am I bringing in like past stuff? But it really is that pause and be like, instead of reacting and, you know, going full force of like, I have to run. It's really like, what am I feeling right now? Is this relevant to the situation or is this past stuff coming up? And this is years of work that I've done. And I have to acknowledge I'm a human, right? Everyone has human experiences, right? And we go back and forth. Right. right? And, and that's, and like the example you just gave really shows a level of maturity and taking personal mm -hmm. responsibility. And I feel like this whole process is kind of growing up. <laughs> like, I feel like I grew up in my forties, <laughs> it started happening. Cause it was so, it's like, I wasn't, I didn't have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we don't have to deal with things until something happens, something significant happens off. And a lot of people move through life without confronting their issues. A hundred percent. And I think too, like people, I always ask like when I'm doing an assessment of like relationship patterns, I always say like, what was your frame of reference growing up? What did healthy relationships look like? Currently, who are you surrounded by healthy relationships? You know, like, what is that viewpoint? How have you been conditioned to look at relationships, the relationship with yourself, where you taught how to be confident? A lot of things that we probably lacked growing up or, you know, missing pieces to that puzzle of like cultivating self is giving yourself grace that some things you may have to learn as an adult on this healing journey, like skill building, what a relationship looks like. What kind of relationship do you want to get in? Knowing that a healthy relationship might not feel familiar to you and that might feel dis, you know, discomfort. So how do I you know, learn about secure relationships? So just giving yourself grace that you're not supposed to know it all and you weren't taught it all. And that might have been what really led to some of your behaviors and patterns as well. Yeah, and I like also how you just mentioned how it may be um, discomforting, I think. Uh, that's a bit of an understatement for people who have been in one or more really toxic relationships that often when they start dating, um, a, a healthy partner can feel very boring yes. because our brains have been conditioned to so much drama. Do you notice that with your clients also? Yeah, definitely boring where you're like, oh, you know, I've heard clients say like, I like the bad boy type, you know, or like the bad, like, and I'm like, okay, but why, right? Like, you know, we dive into that. It could be boring, but it can also be scary. Like I got into a healthy, secure relationship. 
um, I just was like, when is the other shoe going to drop? When is the ugly side going right. to drop? You know, like, right. this, this, um, I can't really enjoy this because I don't want to put myself out there, the vulnerability. I don't want to, you know, so it can go two folds. It could be like, it's boring and they're not my type, or it can be like, this feels good, but there's, it's scary because now I have to be vulnerable and I have to, if it feels so good, when is it going to end? You know, so I get a lot mm. more of those type of clients that are just like, ooh, this feels uncomfortable too. Right? Yeah, yeah, that that makes so much sense. Mm. So, so how do you, how does one know when they actually have, it's not like you can say I'm completely healed, but how do you know when you are genuinely healing from relationship wounds? Yeah. So part of the process, what I work with my clients on um, is really one, putting the mirror to self, right? And kind of saying, you know, what role do, do I play or what are the things that I need to heal personally from? So maybe I have self-worth issues where it's like, I truly don't really believe that I deserve or can be in a healthy relationship. Um, really understand self-esteem. Like, how do I feel about myself? What you know, um, what does it look like to be alone, right? Mm. Can I stand um, in not being with someone, but still enjoying my time and even creating a community of healthy relationships outside of an intimate partner, right? Like really looking at your values. Um, so really getting clarity on who you are, what you want and what your expectations are moving forward in a healthy relationship. I would say that is number one. And then the other is like really advocating for self. So if you meet someone, um, you know, are you advocating for yourself? Are you prioritizing your needs, wants, non-negotiables? And even if someone, I have, a, I have a test, I'm like, you know, Denzel Washington was always my like, <laughs> my crush. And I say like, if Denzel Washington was to walk in and um, he was, it was something on my non-negotiable list, right? Even as appealing as he may be, could I say, no, it does not feel right. I'm not going to do this, right, with him. Or will I waver? Because sometimes we do because we uh, think like, oh, we'll never find another. But can yeah. I stay with my power to have boundaries with myself and with other people, right? So if you can start doing more of that, like these are short to tell signs that you're you're more moving towards that path of healing and really self-advocating. Um, and then when you get in relationships, just being able to navigate those feelings that come up and are you feeling secure in your relationship? Are you feeling like you can navigate stress or conflict that comes in all relationships, but do you feel like you can do that in a safe way? Um, so those are some of the sure tell signs that I would say the, that you're on the path. Of healing. That's great. And I I, I feel like you should give it a name like the Denzel Washington factor. Do you have the Denzel Washington? Do you have the blank fill in the blank? <laughs> That's excellent. That's like a great exercise to do that. That'd be fun to yeah. think about that one. Um, okay. So we know that, um, you know, we talked a bit about emotional healing in terms of affecting future relationships. We're thinking more romantically, but I would think that emotional healing really impacts our lives in other relationships, specifically, not just our future relationships, but our current relationship. Can you talk about how, how that kind of healing affects our relationships? And then I want to ask you about a specific relationship afterwards. Yeah. So current relationships, you know, again, looking at the quality of the relationships that you currently have, whether your coworkers, your, you know, you know, your friendships, um, you know, we all connect in different ways. Like, you know, we can't avoid, you know, relationships. So it's really being able to examine that and what are you providing? You know, what are they providing for you? I find that a lot of people tend to be in like these codependent types of relationships, even outside of, you know, um, intimate relationships. And it's like, they're giving, 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 or trying to um, I would say teach, solve and make better. Right. And it is mm -hmm. at the expense of yourself, right? So are your re relationships reciprocal or are they where you it's one-sided? Um, are you able to communicate, problem solve, conflict, you know, the conflict resolution in those relationships? 
or are there things that you might need support on, you know, because those are things that are important and ingredients in relationships. I think if you're dealing with a high conflict situation, like you're, you know, if you have a partner, you're co-parenting, it's really kind of saying like, what are the things most likely it's the boundaries, it's the self advocacy um, of kind of saying like, I will tolerate this, I won't tolerate this. You know, um, do you have a supportive community that you can vent to have support when you're dealing with these high conflict relationships that you can't avoid? like parenting, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you have to have a supportive community. You have to have, or a, a professional that is gonna help you navigate that. Um, but boundaries are important. Communication is important. Um, conflict resolution, because those are all things that still show up throughout the spectrum of your relationships. Yeah, you know, there's all this talk about something called imposter syndrome, like I'm not good enough. And I would think that somebody who has experienced healing emotionally, that that would, that would help with that area. Yeah, I think, um, you know, imposter syndrome shows up in so many ways in our, in our lives. And I think that there's this, you know, cultivating your confidence, um, being able to like give yourself a pep talk of like, I can do this, I'm capable. I love affirmations for that, right? To be like, oh, you know, maybe I've navigated this before, finding the evidence of like why this will work, you know, why you are the expert in this or this experience, right? So really boosting yourself up and, you know, imposter syndrome will, it's kind of, it will lie to you. It's like, you gotta get the evidence to say like, no, that's not true. Like I've done this before, I'm capable, or I have the support, you know, to navigate this, you know, situation. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny when you said affirmations, I was thinking Chris and I with our clients, we come up with affirmations, but they're not like sweet. Yeah. They're kind of like, we tell our clients, put a post-it note and it's like, I'm not your bleep anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything which gets you, gets you through it. But the, the, the relationship that I wanted to ask specifically about, um, mm -hmm. because this is part of the topic of our next book is, uh, how does emotional healing of oneself affect our relationship with our children? How can mm -hmm. children benefit from parents who have done the work? Oh, I love that. And I, that's such a great book topic. Mm -hmm. I would say um, our healing is a ripple effect for future generations, right? Our healing is a ripple effect. So if you have children, the fact that you are going within and doing the healing work is going to disrupt these patterns that might be generational, right? It might be, again, thinking about frame of reference, how did you observe healthy relationships, healthy relationship with self, who taught you? And so if you were part of that pattern generationally with you, by healing, it's really gonna, you know, show your kids a different way. The way that you communicate with them, you know, modeling better healthy communication with them, teaching them and exposing them to healthy relationships, you know, when you're getting into new ones or um, if you're kind of teaching them how to have a better bond with you, right? Because again, it, it translates into parenting. All these things, like you become that model, right? And they're seeing it, they're observing it. And you can also share with them, you know, your journey, right? Um, but it's a ripple effect. The work that you do now will impact your kids now and future generations. Yeah, yeah. I see a comment. When you heal yourself, you heal seven generations back and forward. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. And I think, and I'm, I'm so proud of parents that really, you know, I always say like, just you showing up for therapy is the start of that process. So give yourself kudos that you are being the best model for your kids and showing them that it's, they have permission to heal. They have permission to show their emotions and you can create a better quality relationship with them. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. All right. Tell us one of your client success stories, someone who actually went through what you guys did and what's happening now. Oh my goodness. I have so many <laughs> client success stories. I, I'm like, which one do I pick from? I would say that 
you know, when I first met one of my clients, it's it's been about two years, but when I first met her, she was just anti-relationships. She had gone through some traumatic um, relationships in her in her past that made her just say like, I will never get back in relationship. And so I met her and I'm like, oh, so you, you, you never want to get, you know, you never want to be in a relationship. Like, absolutely not. And she, ta- she had some relationship issues with mom as well, right? So we did some EMTR. We really acknowledged her past childhood and things that she did not get and felt neglected. Um, she had a lot of internalization of like, it's my fault, um, you know, um, a lot of internal anxiety and not feeling like she could show up for her friends and family in an authentic way and self advocate. But with really honing in and giving her permission to feel, to explore her past traumas, she was able to one, find her dream partner, you know, they've been together for a year, right? Once she did the healing work and committed and said, I am open for relationships now, she was able to, you know, find that person. So she had to like feel safe enough to do that. Mm -hmm. And then on a intergenerational level, she has a, you know, has a daughter and was able to advocate for her daughter when, you know, um, there were some issues with grandma speaking to daughter in the same way and just standing up for her daughter and just saying like, you, you, you cannot do that. This is my child and really setting boundaries and self advocating. And mom really received that. And it was just like, Charlie, like, yes, like you, you can do this. And it, there was no repercussions. Like it worked and expressing yourself in a healthy way was helpful. Um, and even in her relationship, because, you know, you got to maintain the relationship, learning how to communicate, learning when there's conflict, that it doesn't mean you got to throw the whole relationship away, but you can work together to, you know, come up with a better approach. So she really has security in her relationships, but she had to do a lot of that inner work and then set, get clear on her boundaries, feel comfortable communicating to people at work, her mom, you know. And now her daughter, like they have a deeper relationship. Like her daughter was like, you are my best friend. <laughs> like, you know, I'm still a parent, but I feel connected to you because she was connected with self and that translated and rippled into the rest of her world. And that's so, and that, that's amazing. And also because it involved her mother. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's like three generations of females. And so she stood up to her mother and protected her daughter at the same time. Mm-hmm. And her mom received it well. It wasn't like, because sometimes we think like if we talk out what's going to happen, you know, like mm-hmm. the, what's the repercussion and the fact that she was able to, and it worked, gave her validation and confirmation that she could continue to do that. Like, it's okay to self-advocate and set boundaries. Wow. That's, that's excellent. So, yeah. Shmiel, how can people find you, not you exactly, because you're busy with a bunch of stuff, but how can they get this kind of information? Yeah, so we have our, you can follow us on our page, Healing Springs Wellness, um, that we have a team of 15 therapists and um, dietitians, so feel free to follow us. We're located in Connecticut, so we do both virtual and in-person um, appointments, and we do take insurance. We are actually doing a Healing from Relationship Wounds group. Um, starting, I think, in the end of November, but you stay stay on top of the page, but it'll be a coaching intensive program where we will be doing some transformational work on healing those relationship wounds. So, yeah, definitely feel free to, you know, reach out to our page and our website is healingspringswellness.com. So we have a lot of good articles and blogs and, you know, services on there. So feel free to check it out as well. All right. Well, Thank you so much, Chenille, and we're going to be back in touch, and we'll be virtually visiting you yeah. and your team at the end of the month, but um, I so appreciate this, and I think it's it's really good for people to hear success stories like that, this, instead of feeling like if you're I'm trapped in the cycle and I'm just damaged forever, Yeah, but that's not true. Keep the hope hope and know that there is a way to do and I don't call it just like trauma care it's trauma healing I've seen a lot of transformational things happen um, and it's transcended into relationships into the your purpose like in your careers like doing this healing work 
will be a ripple effect in different dimensions of your life. So just keep the hope alive, align with the community. Thank you for creating this community, Lisa. It's so needed. And I appreciate you having me today. No, it's great. All right. So we'll talk soon. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye.